So welcome again, everybody. I am Christine Biglin from St. Mary's County Library. And tonight we are joined by Barb Whipke, uh, who is the owner of Wild Birds Unlimited in Lexington Park and La Plata. And our topic tonight is, um, who is nesting in my backyard? It is that time of year, and we wanna find out who our visitors are and how to take care of them. Um, so without further ado, um, I hope I've met a lot of you already, and if not, I hope you'll stop in the store so I get a chance to. You do stop in the store if I'm not here. All of our team are certified bird feeding specialists, so everybody is trained to help you out with it, whatever questions you have. Feel free if you stop in to take videos, pictures of your backyard. That is very, very helpful when we're trying to help you figure out positioning for birdhouses, bird feeders, things like that. On a daily basis, we look at phone pictures and videos and it truly is helpful. So don't be embarrassed to bring those phone pictures into us. It truly does help us. So we're gonna get started this morning um, or I guess this evening. I'm gonna share my screen here and we'll cover a little PowerPoint and then I'll take it off screen share and show you some different products and things that will explain some things a little clearer. So this little picture on the right is actually a mockingbird nest that I saw down at Point Lookout this year. That was pretty cool to get to see mama mockingbird feeding the babies. A mockingbird nest, if you get one of those in your yard, they tend to nest in a single tree and they are very territorial. You will absolutely know if you have one of those nesting in your yard because they will swoop down on everybody that tries to walk near that tree. So you will know without a nest, without a doubt that you have them nesting in your yard. So we're gonna talk today about who those birds are that you have nesting in your yard, how we can recognize them and what their nesting habits are. We're gonna cover things like basic necessity, food, water, cover, shelter, and places to raise young, things that you can do to help those birds out. So food, a big one is high protein, high calcium for nesting birds. They need that protein. Their protein needs increase during nesting period because they need that for good egg protect, production and the health of the young. Birds' feathers are made up of over 90% protein. So they need a reliable source of high protein foods to grow those feathers. Calcium is also very important. If you're shopping in our store, any of our bark butter products have calcium in those. So if you're using bark butter, bark butter bits, bark butter bricks, bark butter suets, anything that has the bark butter name in it, calcium is already added to those products. As well, if you're using any of our foods that say plus, so Tree Nutty Plus, No Mess Plus, those foods have calcium added to them as well. So you can rest assured if you're using those foods, there's already some calcium added. As well, the nesting super blends, if you're using those, either in loose seed or in the cylinders, there's extra calcium there as well. And then water, of course, we all know they need water for drinking, but a lot of people don't realize the importance of healthy feathers in birth. During this time of year, they need those feathers to keep their little skin from getting sunburned. In the winter, they need those feathers to, they fluff up those feathers in the winter. Have you noticed how your birds look bad in the winter? They're fluffing those feathers up to form pockets of insulation so that they can keep warm. So feathers, healthy feathers are important year round. And they keep those feathers healthy, not only by good nutrition, but also having water to bathe in. So water is important year round for them to both drink and to bathe in. We're gonna look at some common types of nests that you're going to see. So the cup nests are those ones you're used to seeing in a tree. You're walking, you're looking at a bush, a tree, those first nests that we've seen as kids that 
you know, that first bird nest you were familiar with is what we know as a cup nest. Then there's platform nests. Those are those ones typically quite often made out of, there's usually some mud in them, but they're just on a shelf. I'm not even sure I have one in stock right now. That's a product we've been struggling with. That supply chain's a wonderful thing right now, but it's basically just a shelf. Um, robins are a famous one for building on a shelf like that. Just a board up, a board, just an L-shaped board, and they'll plant a, a nest right there, but they use a lot of mud to hold that nest together. So that shelf works perfect for them. What we call a secondary cavity nester, those are birds like our bluebirds, meaning they don't make that cavity they rely on someone else to make that cavity. An abandoned woodpecker hole or a birdhouse that you have put up because they don't have the ability to create a cavity themselves. And then there's primary cavities, which would be like our woodpeckers who will get in there and dig out, pound out and create a cavity for themselves. So that's your primary cavity nest. So that's our basic four types of nests that we're going to talk about. So then nesting sites, dead snags. One of the best things you can do is that tree. We lost a lot of trees this year during that snow and ice storm. Any of those trees that the top broke out of, if you can safely leave some of those trees, please do. Those are going to make some amazing homes for some of the birds, insects, lots of different little animals. So if you can safely leave them, they're not going to fall and take out a fence, shed, car, leave some of those trees and watch them evolve over the years into some different houses. Um, those trees are also great for smearing bark butter onto as a food source, which is gonna then attract some of those birds in and it's just going to create that whole little cycle. Secondary cavity nesters, they're going to look for those houses that you're going to put up, those tufted tit mice, bluebirds, Carolina wrens, so any nest boxes you can provide. You want to be sure that you're looking to make sure it's the right size hole on those nest boxes. So if you're going out there just buying a random nest box that you just fall in love with, you may want to stop in with that nest box. Feel free to walk in the store with it. We've got some little metal rings and we can look at the box, see what bird it might be appropriate for. And then you can purchase the ring to put on there and resize that hole to the appropriate size. So if it's got a big mass of hole on it, the box might be sized correctly for a chickadee, but if it's got a large hole, it's going to allow a larger bird to reach in there and snatch out those babies. So if we can resize that with a smaller opening, you can turn it into a safe home now for a chickadee. Bushes and trees, leaving some of those dense bushes as good options for like our cardinals and that, our great ones. Cardinals have already started nesting. So leave some of those thick if you can to allow them good nesting sites. And then nesting boxes are pretty important. That top little nest box up there, I see these all the time. Drugstores are famous for selling these cute little nest boxes. Those are great if you want to get those and sit them around on your kitchen cabinets. <laughs> Please don't put those out to let the birds nest in. If you want to put them outside to decorate with, you can do that. Just block the hole so that no birds can nest in those ones. That is a really thin wood. It's not a safe housing. The one down there in the bottom is one of our houses. I have pretty much the same one sitting here on the table, just a different color. 
it's still a decorative house, but it's made out of a thicker wood, right sized hole. And the biggest key to it is that back here is a spot to clean it out after they nest in. So this one is perfectly fine. It's still cute, but you can use this one for the birds to nest in. So they don't have to all be just plain Jane nesting boxes. They can still be cute and functional, but you just want to look Make sure you've got those a thick enough wood. You've got a clean out spot on there and they are sized right for the holes. And the one the bottom right is more of a functional design. That's actually one of our houses there. Okay, so then we're gonna get into the birds. Northern Cardinals have already started nesting. Does seem like it's a little early, but I think it's just because winter hasn't really seemed to want to let hold, uh, let go of us this year. But the they are already nesting. The bluebirds, of course, have already begun, but bluebirds are always our first nesters of the year. So cardinals are going to nest in shrubs, typically one to fifteen feet high, most commonly. We tend to see them in the three to five foot range. We don't pick the best locations. They tend to be right at high level, high level, good sites for dogs and kids to find them, predators, snakes, raccoons. And of course they are right in bushes. There's not a lot you can do to protect them, unfortunately. They are cup nesters, they're not cavity nesters. Putting a birdhouse out is not going to do a thing. There is nothing you can do to protect it. Actually, the best thing you can do is if you spy a cardinal nest, is look the other way and pretend you did not see it. They will occasionally abandon a nest if they feel that they were spotted. So they are one, whereas like the bluebirds, I'm telling you, go out, check the nest, document it. Cardinals, if you spot them, just pretend you didn't and keep going and look the other way. They will occasionally abandon theirs. So don't get very involved in theirs. A lot of times you'll find them somewhere where you can actually look at them from inside your house, outside. They tend to build close to houses so that you actually get a sight from inside your house that you can look right out a window and peek down at the nest. So the male feeds the female as part of the courting ritual, which is kind of cool to see. The clutch side is typically two to five eggs. They will have one to two broods a year, which is a good thing because they often don't have successful broods because of their choice of locations. And it's also good that they tend to have larger broods because again, often snakes or raccoons will get them. The incubation time, as with all songbirds, they lay their eggs but don't start setting on the nest until they have a full clutch. So they'll lay one egg a day, when that nest is full, when it's complete, that's when she'll start setting on those eggs. So if you see those eggs start appearing, she hasn't abandoned them. She's not going to start setting until she has a full clutch. And that's with all of our songbirds. As I mentioned, always watch from a distance. Once those babies have fledged, daddy's going to take over feeding them and mom's going to start on the next. That's really cute to see. The dad cardinal is a great daddy. You'll see him three to five babies and they'll be full size. When songbirds leave the nest, they are adult size. By the time a songbird leaves, they're the same size as the parents. It's just a case of their feathers aren't fully grown in, which gives them the appearance they're a little smaller their tail feathers will be a little shorter, but they're about the same size as the adult. Fun fact, 
Only a few of our songbirds are able to sing. They have a call, but not a song. The female cardinal does have a song that she sings. And unfortunately, while she's sitting on that very poorly located nest, she likes to sit there and sing. So not only is she in a very obvious location, she's sitting there singing, giving away her location. So if you hear that, just kind of stay away and ignore her and pretend you don't hear her. And then there's the morning dove. Quite often we'll get calls in the store. I found a little white egg laying on my sidewalk. I found a little white egg laying on my deck or laying on my porch rail. That would usually be a morning dove. They just kind of get sidetracked. I often say they have that little tiny head because it doesn't need to be much bigger. There's not a whole lot going on in there. They just kind of forget that they need to build a nest and just kind of drop an egg here or there, or wherever. And then they forget where they put them and they forget to go back and settle on and out. They just drop those eggs anywhere they want to. They typically lay two eggs in a nest. Fortunately for them, they do up to five nests a year, which they need to because like I said, often they get sidetracked and forget to set on that nest. It's very common that they will abandon a nest. Again, they get sidetracked and go off to do something else and forget that they were working on a nest over here and go do something else. The male typically takes the day shift with the morning doves and the female takes the night shift, which is backwards of a lot of our songbirds that share the setting. A lot of them, like our downy woodpeckers, the female takes the day shift and the male takes the night shift, but the morning doves does it backwards. If you've got a planter sitting out that you, the plants died off and you were getting ready to put something new in it, you better do it pretty quickly or you're liable to find a morning dove nest in there. And then our Carolina chickadees. They can excavate a nest. So if they find part of a tree that is rotting out, they are actually able to dig that out and turn that into a hole to nest in. And the two of them will work together on that rotten wood to build out to create a nest. Um, a lot of times they'll take an abandoned woodpecker nest and dig it out a little more and turn it into a nest. They will nest anywhere from two to 25 feet high. They'll often use bluebird houses. Back up there. A lot of times they'll use a bluebird house. You can always tell their nest from a bluebird house because they are gonna build their nest completely out of moss, other than the top layer, which is going to be a fine hair. If you've got pets around, or rabbit fur, something like that. They like to use things like that to line it. With the pet hair, I will mention that we used to say, when you brush your pets, put the hair out there for the birds. We don't recommend that anymore because of the fact that we're now using more chemicals on our pets. Um, you know, we're using flea treatments and things like that. So we no longer recommend using pet hair. However, they will find pet hair Alpaca hair is a good one. Um, actually, we have some little peanut ball feeders in the store with some alpaca hair in them. And then off season, these can be used for peanut splits or bark butter bits. Um, we were actually given this alpaca hair by Tyler Bell, who is, a lot of you know him in the birding world, but he's working with the Maryland Breeding Atlas and we'll get into that toward the end. So. You're paying the same for the peanut feeder as you always would. The team just stuffed some of the alpaca fur he gave us into these peanut ball feeders. So you've got them to use as nesting. And then after nesting season, you can use them as feeders. But alpaca fur is a really good one for them to use. 
but they'll use that to line the nest with. Uh, so one, if you see a nest being built and you decide to go and check it, like they built that nest, but they're not laying any eggs in it. The cool thing chickadees will do while they're laying those eggs, anytime, so they lay an egg, and I mentioned they don't start setting until they have that full clutch. They'll lay an egg, then they're gonna go off and wait till the next day. They'll pull that fur over that egg, go do their stuff for the day. Next day they come back, move the fur, lay another egg, pull that fur back over, do their stuff. And every day they'll pull that fur back over to cover those eggs to protect them until they're finally ready to set. So people will come in and tell us, you know, they built this nest, but they never laid any eggs. And I'll say, you know, stick your finger down in there and feel, and oh my gosh, it's full of eggs. <laughs> so they're really sneaky little birds with that. So they lay three to 10 eggs. Um, and usually they are on the upper side of seven to 10 eggs. So that's why you see so many chickadees at your feeders. And just a little side note, a lot of people think we have black cap chickadees here. We do not. The chickadees you're seeing here are Carolina chickadees. I know our grandparents taught us they were black cap chickadees. But our chickadees in this area are Carolina chickadees. If you get over into Western Maryland, more to the mountains, you could be seeing either one over in that area. But here in Southern Maryland, we've got the Carolina chickadees. They only nest once in the summertime. They'll be nesting really soon. So if they're using your bluebird box, go ahead, let them use it. Once they're done, your bluebirds will have it for their other two nestings. They're only gonna nest once and then they're going to be done. So one and done, and that's because they raise such a big brood so they can get it done and over with. They're gonna set on those eggs for 12 to 15 days. 16 to 19 days, those babies will be ready to leave. And it takes, mom does all the setting on that nest. And as I mentioned, she uses that fur to cover those eggs. And then the tufted titmouse. They are also cavity nesters. So that nest, take a close look at that because as that nest begins, it starts with a lot of moss as well. But then you can see they start to work a lot of leaf chips in there as well. So you can see where that chickadee one, the save moss all the way up, they start working a lot of pieces of leaves into theirs. And that's how you're going to tell the difference when you open that box as to whether it's a chickadee or a titmouse. You won't find those pieces of leaves if it's a chickadee box. So they're, they're going to have, it's gonna start out in the beginning, you're not gonna be able to tell which it is. But as soon as they start bringing those leaves in, that'll be your, the key that you'll know. And then they're going to line them with soft materials, hair, fur, fur wool, your dog's an outside dog, you may very well catch them out there. Hit mice will actually go and pull the hair right out of a dog to take. There's videos out there of them pulling hair from people, coming and taking the hair right out of a person's head to use in their nest. They really like to mix a lot of hair in there, whether they take it from a dog or a person or a hurt horse. So they will find that hair somewhere. And same thing, they're only gonna have one brood a year. So they're going to nest early on as well. Again, they will use those bluebird boxes too. So if they take over a bluebird box, they'll finish up and get out and your bluebirds will still have two chances to use it after that. Again, they're gonna have three to nine as well. They tend to be a little closer to the five and six, not quite as, many as the chickadees. Uh, incubation 12 to 14, pretty similar to our chickadees on that. The male will feed the female. So you're gonna see him bringing 
a lot of food to her. As she gets out and comes to feed her, you're going to see him feeding her. You will also often see young from last year's coming back and helping to feed. Tufted titmouse, the young stay with them an entire year. So we say tufted titmouse, they are never empty nesters because they will always have the young from the previous year with them. So they never have that opportunity to be an empty nester. And then house finches. So house finches are one a lot of people get confused and think they are purple finches. If they are nesting, they are not purple finches. We only see purple finches here in the winter time. So I can assure you if it's nesting season, it's house finches. The male is the one with the red and the female will have no red on. We've had a few purple finches here this winter, not many. We typically only see them when it's an eruption year. Last year we had quite a few. We had a few this year, not many. So what we're going to be seeing this summer will all be house finches. If you have a wreath on your door and you don't want them nesting, you better pop out there tonight and get that down because they will be nesting in that very soon. And then you'll either be not using that door for a while. You will have a mess. They are a dirty, dirty nester. They are messy when they nest. They typically like to nest about 10 to 15 feet high. They love to nest in reeds. They'll also nest in hanging baskets, um, lamp posts, buildings, anywhere close to the house. They love to nest. Fine stems, leaves, twigs. Uh, but if there's a good location on your porch or close to your house, that's where they're going to be. So take inventory of that porch tomorrow and anything you don't want ruined, don't want them nesting in, I would suggest putting that away for a little while because they will be nesting there if not. They raise two to six. Incubation period is going to be 13 to 14. Their eggs are different than bluebirds. A lot of people get those eggs confused with bluebirds and get really excited, think they have bluebirds. See those black spots on those eggs? The bluebird eggs are going to be blue, but they will not have any spots on them. Bluebirds are also only going to be nesting inside a cavity. They're not going to be making an open nest. But that blue with those spots on it, that's your house finch nest. They are also going to nest one to six times this summer. Again, check that porch tomorrow. Look at that wreath that you really, really like because I can promise you once they're done nesting, you won't be keeping it. The females do most of the nest shopping, so that's going to be that brown bird. He comes behind and decides whether she's made a good choice. Something a little neat about house finches as where most songbirds use insects to feed their young, house finches pretty much keep their babies as strictly vegetarians. They feed pretty much no insects to their young. So they're going to be looking pretty much just for suet, seed, things like that to feed their babies. They prefer not to give them any insects. Okay, what do these things have in common? Any ideas? Carolina wren. All of those are locations where a Carolina wren will nest. You've got a propane tank. They love to nest in there. You've got a jacket hanging out there. They will be in that pocket. 
Don't leave a pair of work boots sitting out on your porch too long unless you allow them to rest the nest in there. They choose the craziest locations. If you've got a boat out there or a trailer with a tongue on it, kayak, I'm trying to think of some of the crazy calls we've received. Of people like, oh my gosh, what do I do? <laughs> Random places that they will, and they love to be close to your house, but a barbecue grill. Um, yeah, if you, we often get calls around Memorial Day, 4th of July, people plan a barbecue and all of a sudden they open their grill and somebody has a nest in there. So they, they are cavity nesters. So they're looking for cavities to get in and nest. And they prefer to be close to your house. So they're looking for any places like that. So again, check that porch tomorrow. <laughs> if you put a hanging basket up, they love to nest in hanging baskets. If you don't mind them there, it can be a cool experience to watch them in the hanging baskets. I usually try to put a couple of geraniums on my front porch early in the season and one nests every year. However, for some reason, she thought I should have had it up in February this year. So she instead decided to nest in a gourd that I had out there for her to roost in this year. So I guess I won't be putting a hanging basket up because she already has started nesting in a gourd. But normally I put one up really early in March and let her nest in it because it's fun to watch her there. But this year she beat me to it. So she's nesting in a gourd, which is pretty small, but she chose it. The three to six feet off the ground is what we say. But if your coat's hanging higher, if that gourd's hanging higher, she'll choose that too. They do one to three broods a year five to seven eggs. They, the mom, well, the dad builds most of the nests and they build a funny nest. Um, it's almost like an igloo. It has a top on it. Mom will come along. If she decides she likes it, then she'll put a lining in that and then she'll put a front porch on it. And then she'll decide to nest in that. They also do something where if he decides this is where he wants the nest, any potential locations nearby, he will build fake nests in those. Just build the start of a little nest to discourage anybody else from building nearby. So you may see the start of nests popping up and then all of a sudden nothing ever happens with those. He was just building decoys to keep anybody else from building up too close to him. So if you see something like that starting that starts and never happens, that was probably just part of his game. And there's a couple pictures of those nests like I was talking about. It. That, and actually, ironically, there's one in a barbecue grill. So yeah, as you can see somewhere, there's one in a boot up there at the top and it looks like just a box of whatever there. And they build them out of just a little bit of everything. You never know what you're going to find in theirs. And then the Eastern Bluebird. Um, cool thing, the male finds the site. Once he has found the location, he goes and gets the female, brings her. She checks it out. A lot of times he'll have found a couple. If you have nest boxes up and you have a couple, he thinks they're both good locations. He'll go get her, bring her. She'll check them both out. She makes the decision which one is, is going to work. When she starts building, he does nothing other than is the cheerleader. Truthfully, he's sitting there kind of watching guard, but she does all the nest building. A lot of times, once she's chosen the house, she'll put a little piece of pine straw in there. And we say that's the rent deposit. And she'll pop that in there just to let everybody else know that that's the location, that she's chosen it and nobody else better touch it. It may be several weeks before they actually decide to start building. 
You won't even see them watching it, but let a chickadee or a tit mice come by to check out that house and you watch how quick somebody comes flying in. Those two will come out of nowhere to chase that chickadee or tit mice off of their house. So it's pretty cool to watch. And like I said, it can take two or three weeks and you're like, they're never going to build. And then all of a sudden you go out one day and the nest is half built. Once they get the urge to build, then it seems to just happen within hours. Three to 20 feet is what we typically see their nest heights. However, if you are putting up a nest, we recommend that it be about five feet high. That would be the opening where we would want that hole to be. They are a secondary cavity nester, meaning that's that one that is not able to excavate a nest. So they're reliant on those abandoned woodpecker holes or us providing them nest boxes. Uh, four to five eggs, it's actually four to six eggs that they typically lay. We most commonly see in our area five eggs. And then we most commonly in our area see three broods a year. They set on the egg. Mama does all the setting, 12 to 14 days until hatch. And they typically fledge in our area. We typically see them fledge about 18 days. The last fledge of the year, we often see them leave about 17 days. I guess the heat speeds things up a little bit, but they do seem to leave a little earlier on that last brood. And as we talked about those eggs before, you can see those eggs are solid blue. There's no black spots whatsoever on those. And around here, their eggs are going to be, or their nests are going to be pretty much just pine straw and dried grasses. And then the lazy cowbird. So there is what we call a parasitic bird, meaning this bird does not build their own nest. They used to travel, travel with the buffalo herds. So they were never around long enough to raise their own egg. But they know their job is to keep reproducing. So the way they overcame that was they would drop their eggs in other birds' nests. So that's how they keep reproducing. So in this case, that's a house finch nest. See the blue eggs with the, the black spots? That funny colored eggs is a cowbird egg. So that mama bird has come in there within seconds. She has deposited her egg. She's gone on her way. She will do that to bluebirds, chickadees, and she can get into a bluebird box. So if she could, if a chickadee's in a bluebird house or something with a hole that size, she can pop in there. Any Carolina wren, I've had them do it to Carolina wren. She'll pop in there, drop off eggs everywhere she can. Typically, most commonly drops one egg in each nest. So she spreads the wealth around. Let's other birds raise her young. She goes on her merry way. They are a protected bird. It's, there's nothing you can do. It's illegal to do anything with those eggs, to shake them, to break them, to throw them out. It's just a part of nature. It's how they've compensated. So you just have to let nature take its course when you see that. Sadly, because the cowbird is a larger bird, they do tend to cook quicker, so they hatch quicker. By the time these other birds hatch, that cowbird is usually a couple days older, so the eyes open sooner, so they are getting a lot more of the food. So the survival rate is not as great for the other birds. The best thing you can do is offer more food nearby, make it easier for mom and dad to get food to them, suets, bark butters, you know, those high protein, high calcium foods we talked about. Just make it easier for them to provide food to the young. 
Other than that, there's nothing you can do. It's nature. It's the way nature figured it out. It makes it work. It is frustrating. I know I've been there. I've seen it. The positive is they also fledge early. So in the case of the Carolina Wren, I was so happy when that baby fledged. And so the rest of those young, then mom could focus on feeding those and the ones that were left did survive. It was better, but so if you see those cowbird eggs, you gotta leave them alone and just let it happen. Okay, so when you offer food, water, cover, shelter, and a place to raise the young. You can turn your yard into a natural habitat. You provide hours of entertainment for you and your family. Cats, a lot of people start feeding the birds for their cats. It's amazing the number of people who actually got into the habit or into the hobby because they put up bird feeders to provide entertainment for their cats to watch out the window. And of course, you're improving the lives of the bird. But there is another thing going on right now, something called the Maryland and DC Breeding Bird Atlas Project. This is a project, it's a five year effort that began in January of 20, covered there for me. Um, I don't know if anybody can see what the year is on that. 20, I think it was 2019, but anyway, it's gonna last for five breeding seasons. So whether you're just a beginning breed, birder or an expert, you can be part of this effort. So all you're gonna do is watch for any signs of breeding or nesting in your yard. That can be birds grabbing nesting material. So if you've got you know, one of the nesting balls here, if you've got any type of nesting material out there and you see a tufted titmouse come and grab it, you would go on that website and you would record that you had a tufted titmouse taking nesting material. If you saw that male cardinal feeding the female cardinal, you can um, record that, that you saw the, the male uh, displaying courting behavior. You see the male cardinal or the bluebird feeding the baby at the feeder, you record it. You check your bluebird box and you've got eggs in there, you record it. So the goal is to try to find all of the species in all of the counties in Maryland to account for them, to see where we may have holes that, you know, do we, you know, why don't we have any cardinals in Ridge? You know, what's going on down in Ridge that, you know, we're really low on breeding birds down there, you know, to try to up the population. So if you would, if you can just copy that down, if you're already on eBird, you can actually link your eBird account through there. Just pop in there when you enter it. You just record the, when you go in to record your bird sightings, it'll give you the option to click on what you saw and you'll choose the highest level, whether it was, you know, the highest level would be nesting, building a nest, a nest in the egg would be a higher level than just building a nest. Or a baby in the nest would be a higher level over an egg. It, it's easy to do. It sounds more complicated than I'm making. When you get in there, you'll see it's really simple. Uh, but it's a really good science project that everybody can get involved in um, while you're watching these nesting birds. So if you, you know, go to that page and you'll find that it's just really easy to be involved in that. So let me take this off screen share. I'm going to, for those that may not have not seen before, this is the nesting blend that I had talked about. smaller instead of bigger. Okay, so this is the nesting blend and we've got it 
in the loose seed and in the cylinders in here. So that has that calcium I talked about. Options for nesting material. I showed you the alpaca hair. We also have nesting balls that can be used. So lots of different options for that. As I mentioned, the decorative, and then we also have just the regular style. Opens at the side, so they're easy to clean. Open at the top, so you can peek in and see what your babies are doing down there. And with that, what questions do you have? I think you might still be on screen share. Oh, is it? Yep. I'm just seeing your, yep, there we go. It's, okay. All right. Um, okay, let's see. Christy did mention that she has some videos of tufted titmouse taking hair right out of the backside of her golden retriever's body. Awesome. <laughs> that the dog didn't notice. <laughs> so Ethan asked, why don't we see more cedar wax wings? So cedar wax wings aren't gonna come to our feeders. So they are going to be up in the trees eating the berries. And actually this year we had a lot more customers than in the past that have been seeing cedar wax wings. So this year was a really good year for customers seeing cedar wax wings. A lot of our customers who had never seen them before did have them. Just don't like And again, feelings. bird baths are the key there. A lot of because they eat those berries, they then need a lot of water afterwards. So a lot of customers who had bird baths then got them at their bird baths after they filled up on those berries. Um, how does everyone check their bird houses when they are over five feet high? You know, like if it's not easy for you to see. Right. Anything. So I like the ones that open at the top. I open the top. I use my cell phone and snap a picture from the top. So just here where it opens at the top, then I'll just snap a picture from the top. You can kind of get in and get out. Yes, exactly. Um, what kind of bird bath do you recommend? That kind of is your preference. Um, winter months, I like a heated one. I always recommend a heated one so that you have water year round. You can add a heater to one you already have. We have in the store, we have everything from glass to concrete to granite to metal, um, plastic. So it, it really is personal preference. Um, if you're in our area, stop in and we'll show you the pros and cons of each. If you have a glass one, I recommend, unless the glass ones we have here have some ridges in it. So those are fine. But if you've got a smooth glass one, I recommend adding some stones to it so that it gives the birds something to grip onto. If your bird bath is too smooth, the birds aren't comfortable to get in there and bathe. How about the placement? Like how, where should it be relative to feeders? Like should it, is it okay to be close? Should it be farther away? Right. How about how close to your house? I wouldn't get it too close because when birds eat before they fly, they poop. So it will be hard to keep it clean. Um, so I have, I have several bird baths. Probably my closest one is probably about 10, 15 feet. But then I have some that are further away too. Um, I would definitely have some nearby within sight of your feeders so that they do have the option of eating. You know, you want them to realize that you've got the whole package there. There's houses nearby, there's food, there's, you know, the whole deal. So you definitely want them within sight of the feeders. Want them to move in. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> Make it a really nice neighborhood. <laughs> exactly. 
Now, do you have to dump the water out of the bird baths and refill it, or do you just keep putting the oh, yeah. water? In? Yeah, I would dump it out every couple of days, clean it, and put fresh in there. During the summer months, it's it's good to have some type of, it's not necessary, but it's helpful to have some type of water mover in there. We have water wigglers, we have water misters, we have little fountains that can go in there. It You don't have to change it as often if you have something like that in there. If you don't have something like that in there, we have some uh, uh, little mosquito, what are they called? Uh, mosquito dunks that you can drop in there so that mosquitoes aren't able to lay in there. So you don't end up with mosquitoes hatching in there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, every every couple of days, depending on the time of year, you'll want to change it. They they once the birds start using it a lot, you'll find you need to change it often. Um, and there's a question: Is it okay to put it near a butterfly garden? Yeah, like, sure. So fly garden doesn't have any effect on like your bat, your bird bath or feeder or anything placement. No, no, they actually. Okay you're gonna find a lot of activities from the butterflies and the bees. And you'll probably, what you'll end up doing is finding yourself adding another bird back because the, the bees and the butterfly will be all over that. If you've got one near a butterfly garden, I would make sure to put a rock in there so that the water's shallow, so that the bees and the butterflies can get on that rock and drink from it where it's shallower realize they actually drank water straight uh -huh. like they don't get yeah. it from their food. Oh. Yeah, sure do. Um, oh, I had a question. When you showed the decorative birdhouse, um, mm -hmm. it had a, a perch on it. And I thought you had mentioned one other time that, that perches are kind of universally bad for birdhouses. Oh, is that right? No, it's, it's a, just a little door handle. It's not really a perch. It's made to oh. look like a little I, I meant the kind that you said are at CVS, you know, the ones that you're not supposed to use. Oh, yeah. That had like yeah. the yeah. little stick sticking out. Yeah, like that's why that's hole. better sitting up on a kitchen counter or something <laughs> up on a kitchen counter. Yeah, perches, um, we don't mm -hmm. recommend perches because, again, that's allowing other birds to sit on that perch and then reach in and snatch out um, eggs or babies or that. Yeah, perches are a no-no. Okay. On birdhouses, perches are a no no. Mm -hmm. Places to, to sit near the, the feeders, though, right? Right, yeah. Perches on feeders okay. are good. <laughs> oh, wait, I just got a new message. I had a rent deposit a month ago, then it was gone a few days later and no activity since. I did see a pair of bluebirds around it recently. Do I still have hope? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I saw your message about that when that happened, Christine. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you had another pair and there was like a little war going on there and so somebody put it in. But I have also, for whatever reason, seen males go in and take it out. Like the hmm. female wants this house and the male go and snatch it out. And so <laughs> for whatever <laughs> okay. reason, even when... The females are in the midst of building. I have seen the male bluebirds go in and take pieces out for some reason. And I don't know what that's all about. I have never been able to figure that one out. But in that case, since it was the single one, I wondered if that was a little bluebird spat war going on between two pairs. Okay, so, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, I'm that one I feel was a spat between two pairs and Almost somebody's afraid to build yet until it settles down. So, yeah, I, I definitely don't think, and it's, I'm actually thankful that a lot of them hadn't start building yet when we had that cold spell last week. We ran into that last year when a lot of them built and we had that cold spell and a lot of the first brood was lost last year because of eggs freezing. So I was really thankful that more pears hadn't started laying already, um, myself included. Mine haven't even finished their nest. They started 
building and then they just kind of stop. So I'm not sure what's going on this year. <laughs> so yeah, don't sweat it. Yeah. If the, okay, maybe the bluebird you. housing, maybe the bluebird housing market's just like the human housing market and it's right? ridiculous. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting that so many of the other species are building before bluebirds this year. But yet the bluebird population is much greater than it has been in some of the years past. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting to try to figure out what's going on here. Okay, and well, it thanks. may be because their population is so great that they just don't feel the need to have to get busy so quickly. Who knows? Nature has it figured out, I guess. <laughs> well, from what you're talking about, the birds are so different from each other. And, and exactly. you know, it's just yeah. so interesting. Yeah. I know. It really um, is. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate you, you know, sorting it, helping us sort it all out. Uh, here's one more question. Um, what is the best time to check the houses? Oh, good question. So I recommend checking after afternoon, um, like say 11 to four-ish. Um, they lay their eggs in the morning. And then I don't want you to check too late into the evening in case it's starting to get cool. So we don't wanna be in there in the morning in case they're trying to lay. And then we don't wanna shoo them out in the evening when it might be cooler and they need to keep those eggs warm. So let's try to do that from like 11 to four. If you're working and not home yet, it's okay. Like right after you get home, you know, do it then. But yeah, let's not do it late in the evening and let's not do it in the morning when they, mama may be in there trying to lay that egg. Um, and you had said last time, like specifically for bluebirds, that you can log the information with the Maryland Bluebird Society. Yeah, so with right. the bluebirds, if you're in St. Mary's County, if you would keep track and at the end of the season, if you would just drop by the store or even just email us here at the store um, and let us know how many broods, bluebird broods you had. Um, you know, I had one brood. They laid five eggs, four hatched, three successfully fledged. And just give me just those basic stats for each nesting you had. Then I'll tally them together, report them to the Maryland Bluebird Society. I'm the St. Mary's County Coordinator for the Maryland Bluebird Society. What we're trying to do is keep an eye on our bluebird population. Right now it's looking great. But there was a time not so long ago when it didn't look so great. And if it starts to go the other way, we would like to get a handle on it before we get to that point. That's great. Well, I'll include that link in the um, follow-up email that I send out um, okay, for, thank you. to the Bluebird Society. Um, I'll also include the link in case anybody missed it um, for the Breeding Bird Atlas. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, I, I will be sending that note out um, probably early next week, and it'll have a link to the recording of this program. Um, it takes a couple days to get it closed captioned, so I just do that before I send it out. Um, and I'll also send a link to our next program, uh, which is going to be all about bluebirds on April 21st. Hummingbirds. So oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm glad you were listening. Yes, all about hummingbirds. We've talked all about bluebirds. Right. Thank you. Yes. All right. Hey, one more quick thing, though, before we oh, go. Sure. Um, Saturday, April 2nd, here at the store from 10 to 2, we will have our Birds of Prey show. If you haven't been to one of these, they're pretty cool. Bring the camera, bring the kids, the grandkids, owls, hawks, falcon, and the coolest raven you've ever met. Oh, we'll nice. Be here, right here in the parking lot. And you can get really close to them. They're all non-releasable animals. And so this lady out of Annapolis is their caretaker for life. They, you know, things such as blindness, wing damage, things like that. And it's a really cool opportunity. 
it's a free show. We bring them in just kind of a thank you to our customers for supporting us. And it's a pretty cool event. If you're around, they'll be in La Plata this Saturday for anybody that's up that way. They'll be there this Saturday from 10 to 2 at our La Plata store. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful event. Um, okay. Well, thanks again, Barb. I appreciate you sure. sharing all your, your vast knowledge.